Once again, I must begin by expressing appreciation to the elders of this church for allowing me the opportunity to be here. I've been looking forward to this opportunity and consider it a privilege. If you're visiting with us this morning, you are an honored guest. We appreciate your presence. And if you have any questions about the things you see or hear, we hope you'll ask those questions. And we'll do our best to give you a Bible answer. In this series of studies, we're talking about some characteristics of a Christian. Now, obviously, in eight lessons, we can't talk about all the characteristics of a Christian. But we are going to talk about a few. In the Bible study, we talked about the need to be impartial from John 4. Lord willing, throughout the week, we'll talk about the need to be humble. The need, at times, to be intolerant. The need to contend for the faith and things of that nature. Right now, though, turn with me, if you would, to 3 John. And we'll talk about the need to be hospitable. When I look at the three epistles that John penned, in addition to the Gospel and the Revelation, I view 1 John as dealing with fellowship with God... 2 John, fellowship with false teachers, there is to be none. And 3 John, fellowship with those who teach the truth. 3 John is an epistle from John to a fellow named Gaius. John begins in verse 1, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Notice that the writer does not identify himself as John or as an apostle. Instead, he calls himself the elder. Now sometimes the word elder is used in reference to an overseer in the local church. Remember in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, we have the qualifications for an elder. But it's also used in a more general sense referring to an older person. 1 Timothy 5.1 says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. It is my conviction that that's the way it's intended here. When John wrote this epistle, he was in his 90s. He was the last living apostle. So it was appropriate for him to identify himself as the elder. By the way, it wasn't necessary for him to identify himself as an apostle. Gaius wouldn't question that. And he writes to the well-beloved Gaius. Interestingly, in this short epistle, which would have fit on one papyrus sheet when it was originally written, four different times he refers to Gaius as beloved. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 5, and verse 11. That shows us the close relationship that the two men had. John loved Gaius. When we write letters today, our custom is to write the person's name who we're sending the letter to first. <coughs> then at the bottom we'll sign our names. But in the first century, it was different. The writer would identify himself first, and then the one to whom the letter was written. And that's what we see here. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius. Now, who was Gaius? We don't know. The truth is, in the first century, Gaius was a very common name, like Bill or Bob today. We read in scriptures about Gaius of Macedonia, Gaius of Derby, and Gaius of Corinth. It is impossible for us to identify just who this Gaius was, or even where he lived. From the letter, we do know that he was a faithful Christian. He's commended for his spiritual vitality. And that's all we know about Gaius. And John says whom I love in the truth. In this short epistle, six times we have the word truth. Six times. 
We live in a world today when many people question whether we can even know truth. <coughs> they see truth as a gray area. John didn't feel that way. John believed in such a thing as absolute truth. And six times in this short epistle, he makes mention of truth. Notice he tells Gaius in his opening remarks that I love you in the truth. There is a sense in which Christians are to love all people. But there is a special relationship that exists among the people of God. We have a love that is founded firmly in the truth. Truth is the bind that brings us together. So John writes to Gaius and says, My beloved brother, I love you in the truth. Verse 2, beloved, I wish, newer versions say pray, above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. John was confident that Gaius was prospering spiritually. And he wished or prayed that he would prosper just as much spiritually. Or excuse me, physically. And what a commendation that was. John says, I know that you're prospering spiritually, and I pray that you'll prosper just as much physically. You see, our concern for one another goes beyond just the spiritual. That's first and foremost. But we should care about one another body and soul, physically and spiritually. And really, when you think about it, the two go together. Verse 3, for I rejoiced greatly. Here the aged apostle says, I rejoiced greatly. It gave me great joy. Why, John? When the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. Now if you look over at 2 John on the next page, we have a similar statement as John writes to the elect lady. He says in verse 4, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. It gave the aged apostle great delight to hear of those who were living according to truth. It brought joy to his soul. The word walkest is used in Scripture metaphorically. It refers to the Christian life, the way he conducts himself. In Ephesians 5.2, Paul said, walk in love. That means live in love. In 1 Thessalonians 2.12, he said, walk worthy of God. That means live worthy of God. The word is used metaphorically of our life, our conduct, etc., and so John says, it gave me great joy when the brethren came and told me of the truth that is in you. That you live according to the truth. Now here's the situation. Most believe that John wrote these epistles from Ephesus. We don't know for sure, but that's the best guess. Well, in the first century, it was not uncommon for preachers to go on preaching missions from town to town and city to city. And as they went out, they were totally dependent upon brethren for support. They were totally dependent upon brethren for food, shelter, providing monetary needs, etc. Well, these traveling preachers had left Ephesus, gone out on one of these preaching tours, came to Gaius' town, received hospitality from Gaius, and now have returned back to John. And they came back to John and they said, John, Gaius, over yonder, we don't know where, but Gaius, over yonder, that man is living according to truth. And John says, Gaius, that brings me great joy. He says there in verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. 
Well, in verse 5, he gets down to the meat of the letter. Gaius has done something very good, and John wants to commend him for that and encourage him to do even more. Gaius had been hospitable. Verse 5, Beloved, by the way, that's not the third time he's referred to him as Beloved. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. Gaius was willing to open his heart and home to the brethren. And in this context, the traveling preachers. Even when those traveling preachers were unknown to him. The King James says, and to strangers. Newer versions say something like, even though they were strangers to you. In other words, when these preachers first came to town, Gaius had never met them before. But when he identified them to be preachers of truth, he was willing to do whatever he could to aid and assist them. It wasn't just to people that he'd known for a long time, even brethren he just met. Once he identified them to be preachers of truth, he opened his heart and home. And John commends Gaius for that. Verse 6, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. So these traveling preachers, having stayed in Gaius' home, have now returned back and they not only told John about it, but they told the whole church about it. They testified of, of Gaius before the congregation. I'm sure Gaius didn't do what he did for the praise of men. Faithful Christians aren't interested in the praise of men. But that was a result of his kindness. The brethren had gone back and they told not only John but others about the great hospitality of Gaius. That word charity in the King James comes from the Greek word agape. And I think it's important that we identify just what that word meant. There were four different Greek words that we would translate as love in English. There was the word eros which refers to a passionate or sexual kind of love. Our English word erotic comes from that word. It's not found in the New Testament. There was the word storgos, which refers to a natural love, the kind of love that a parent would have for their child. That word is used some. There was the word phileo, which refers to brotherly love. We might say fondness. That word is used several times in Scripture. But agape is the greatest love. It is used many times in Scripture, and it's the love that goes beyond mere emotion. Agape love is not dependent upon emotion. It is a willed love. That's why God could command us to love our enemies. Because agape love is not dependent upon our emotions. It was agape love used in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. This word denotes love that seeks the very best for the object being loved. It is a selfless love. It puts their preferences above our own. I think it's important that we understand what he's being commended for. He's commended for his selfless love. Whom, he says in verse 6, of the traveling preachers, if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. When he says bring them forward, the idea is send them forward. In other words, not only help them while they're there laboring in your city, but if they need help going onward, do all you can to help them go onward. Maybe they need extra clothes. Give them clothes. Maybe they need some food. Give them some food. Maybe they need some, con some con companions to go with them. If you can provide that, then please do. Send them 
forward on their journey after a godly sort, we might say in a manner worthy of God. And John says, if you do that, you shall do well. Verse 7, he tells Gaius why he should do these things. Why should he be so hospitable? Why should he aid and assist these men? John gives him some reasons in verses 7 and 8. Number one, he says, Gaius, first of all, it was for his namesake they went forth. It was for the name. That's a reference to Christ. Interestingly, the word Jesus does not appear in this short epistle. But obviously this refers to Jesus. John reminds Gaius, though he probably didn't need reminding, that these men are not on vacation. They're not on a joy trip. These guys have gone forth on a mission. They've gone out for Jesus Christ. Number two, taking nothing of the Gentiles or pagans. These men are not dependent upon unbelievers, nor should they be. They're expecting their brethren to step up. And number three, verse eight, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. The third reason you should help is this. <clears throat> By doing so, you become a fellow helper to the truth. He commends Gaius for his hospitality, <clears throat> encourages him to go above and beyond, then gives him three reasons why he should do so. Number one, they've gone out for his name's sake. It's a labor of love. Number two, they're not expecting or dependent upon Gentiles. And number three, by doing so, you become a fellow helper to the truth. I told you at the beginning that 2 John addresses our attitude toward false teachers. While 3 John addresses our attitude toward those who teach the truth. I want you to see a contrast then. If you look at 3 John 8, notice he says we ought to receive such. Speaking of those who teach truth. Well, contrast that with 2 John 10. What does he say about those who do not teach truth? Receive him not. I think it is very important that we notice this contrast. Third John, speaking of those who teach truth, John says we ought to receive such. Second John, speaking of those who do not teach truth, John said receive him not. Notice also he says in third John 8, by receiving these men, we become fellow helpers to the truth. Well, contrast that with 2 John 11. John says to the elect lady, do not receive those teaching error, lest you become a partaker of their evil deeds. I hope I can make this clear. 3 John, dealing with those who teach truth, receive them, that you may be fellow helpers to the truth. Second John, concerning those who teach error, do not receive them lest you become a partaker of their evil deeds. Do you see that contrast? Surely you do. Without even speaking a word through our actions, we can either be fellow helpers to the truth or we can become partakers of evil deeds. John is dealing with those who taught truth and he says we need to receive those men that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. It reminds me of Matthew 10 verse 41. Remember when Jesus said, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you shall receive a prophet's reward. When I read 3 John, I can't help but think about that. We're to aid and assist those who teach truth and by doing so, will be rewarded accordingly. So he's now commended Gaius for his hospitality. Well, in verses 9 and following, he has to deal briefly with an issue in the church. A 
man named Diotrephes. He says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. It is my conviction that Gaius and Diotrephes were members of the same congregation. <coughs> well, notice the contrast. Gaius was selfless. Diotrephes was selfish. Gaius was full of humility. Diotrephes was full of pride. John says he loveth to have the preeminence. Versions that are newer say something like, he loves to be first or he loves to be the leader. And that's really the idea. Maybe you've known men like that. They're spiritual bullies. It has to be their way or the highway. They intimidate others to gain power. Well, that's Diotrephes. And John says of Diotrephes, Wherefore, if I come, by the way, verse 14 says he planned to come shortly, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words. I love the English Standard Version on that. It says, talking wicked nonsense against us. That's what Diotrephes was doing. And not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. <coughs> Please note the contrast. Within the same congregation, you have a guy named Gaius, a faithful brother, who was doing all he could to help these brethren traveling abroad. You also had a man named Diotrephes. And he was so power hungry that he wouldn't receive even John the Apostle nor the traveling preachers. In Gaius we see a man of hospitality. In Diotrephes we see a man of hostility. What a contrast that is. And John planned to address the problem when he came. He says in verse 11, Beloved, follow not, or imitate not, that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God, meaning he has no fellowship with God. He is far from God. <coughs> Demetrius, he was probably the one who brought the letter. Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not write with ink and pen unto thee. But I trust to see thee shortly, and we will speak face to face. Literally, that would be mouth to mouth. We might say eye to eye or face to face as it's rendered. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Meaning individually. <coughs> now brother, this is a short epistle and there are a lot of lessons we can learn. We can spend all of our time talking about pride. <coughs> Diotrephes had a pride problem. <coughs> pride can destroy a local church. But I want to spend our time talking about the great example of Gaius. Even though he had pressure from within, from within the local church, he still opened his heart and home to these traveling preachers. He provided their needs. If they needed shelter, he gave them shelter. If they needed food, he gave them food. If they needed clothing, he gave them clothing. He understood what his role was. And even with the pressure of Diotrephes, he did what he was supposed to do. Paul taught the necessity of hospitality in Romans 12, verse 13. Peter made mention of hospitality and our responsibility therewith in 1 Peter, 5, 9, or 1 Peter 4, 9. By the way, just as a sad note, I had a good brother who I love in the Lord very much, respect him. He, he at one time took the position, and said others do as well, that it is impossible 
for a Christian to render hospitality to someone they know. And he based that on the fact that the word means stranger lover or lover of strangers. Well, when I first heard that, I thought, surely not. I knew that's what the word meant. But I looked at that 1 Peter 4, 9 passage among others. And Peter says there, use hospitality one to another. Obviously, those brethren would have known one another. And I went back to this brother and I said, you know, I've been thinking about what you said. And wouldn't you agree that we have to judge what a word means not only by its literal definition, but also by the context in which it's used? He said, absolutely, I believe that. I said, well, what about 1 Peter 4 now? Use hospitality one to another. Wouldn't that imply being hospitable even to those brethren you know? And he looked at it and he said, yeah. He said, but you'd be surprised. He said, I'm the only one who felt that way. He said, there are others. So I thought I'd throw that out just as a side note. We're to be hospitable not only to strangers, but even to brethren. If they have a need, who I'm talking about brethren we know. If they have a need, we should supply that need. As Gaius did. And we have many examples. We looked in the Bible class at John 4. Isn't that a good example of the Samaritans being hospitable to Jesus? Or Martha and Mary in Luke 10? Or Simon the Tanner in Acts 9? He opened his home to Peter. Or what about Cornelius in Acts 10? He opened his home to Cornelius. Or vice versa. Cornelius opened his home to Peter. Lydia in Acts 16. What did she constrain Paul and the others to do? To stay with her. In Acts 17, we read about Jason, right? Paul was staying with Jason. An example of hospitality in Acts 18. We read about another example. Aquila and Priscilla. They opened their hearts and homes to Paul in Corinth. My point is this. In Gaius, we have a wonderful example of someone who cared about his brethren and proved it. I fear that sometimes we begin to view one another as just quote-unquote members of the same church. Brethren, we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We have a relationship that is tighter than any physical relationship could be. We are brethren. And we have a responsibility one to another. Cain long ago asked, am I my brother's keeper? Spiritually speaking, the answer is an overwhelming yes. We are our brother's keepers. We need to look for opportunities to be hospitable. John commended Gaius for doing that. If we do it, on that great day of judgment, God will commend us. Yeah, impartiality is a characteristic of a Christian. So is hospitality. If you're here this morning and not a child of God, we plead with you to become one. Come right now believing on the Lord Jesus with all of your heart, but understanding that saving faith is an obedient faith. It is an active, working faith. You must repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3. You must confess your faith publicly, Romans 10, verse 10. And you must be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, etc. If you will take those simple steps, you will come up out of that watery grave born again. Your past sins will be forgiven. And if you live faithfully unto death, He'll give you a crown of life. Jesus did the hard part on the cross so you can do the easy part right now. Swallow your pride. Commit yourself to Jesus. Let Him save you from your sins right now as together we stand and sing.